Good morning. morning. Glad you're here this morning. And a word to our TV viewers, there's room, so come and join us. Most of us are wearing masks, except for those preaching. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's prepare ourselves, our hearts and our minds, to worship our great and mighty God. Stand with me and let's join to read responsively from Psalm 30. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. You have turned my mourning into dancing and clothed me with gladness. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Would you pray with me, please? O Lord, our God, we praise your holy name. Lord, you are the great creator of all things seen and unseen. You are the great redeemer in the person of Jesus, your only Son, our Savior. And you are the comforter the Holy Spirit who comes to live within us, to remind us of all that Jesus taught, and to give us, Lord, your comfort when we mourn. We praise you for your presence here this day, and we make our prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing together that great hymn of praise, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning. Please be seated. <clears throat> because God's faithfulness is great, we have pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. I've been asked from time to time, why do we confess our sins in worship? Didn't Jesus pay for our sins on the cross once and for all? And the answer to that is yes, He did. However, Scriptures command us over and over again to confess our sins to God. When we sin and we fail to confess, we create a barrier between us and the Lord. Confession removes that barrier. 
1 John says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We also confess sins in worship so that we may be cleansed and ready to hear God's word with a fresh heart. So let's use our unison prayer of confession and then confess our individual sins silently. Let us pray. Dear God, you have said that those who mourn are blessed, but we have often failed to genuinely mourn our sin or have remained in denial when faced with a loss. Help us to be truly sorry for our sin and to recognize that life brings losses. Enable us to give our sin and grief to you, trusting that you will redeem them for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's continue to confess silently. Let us pray. Amen. We see in the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah a perfect example of confession and restoration. Isaiah has a vision of God, holy, 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 in his temple. The angels surround him. His robe fills the temple and Isaiah says, Lord, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. And God sends a cherubim, an angel, to touch his lips with a burning coal, symbolizing forgiveness and purification. And then God says, who shall I send to the people? Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. As God's forgiven people, we are to go out into the world to be sent and to say, here I am, Lord. Let's join together in that wonderful hymn of praise, Here I Am, Lord. I will make the hollow. I will 
speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go. All right, let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful today for so very many things. Even in the midst of a difficult time in our nation, Lord, it's clear that your hand is at work, uh, that you, the Lord of land and sky, have heard your people's cry, and that you are responding to those who are reaching out for you during this time. We ask that you would continue to heal, Lord, in all these cases of folks who are hurting physically. Uh, we, we pray that this would be an opportunity for your spirit to touch them, that their spirits would be drawn to you. We know, Lord, that you use pain as a megaphone to get our attention, and we ask, Father, that we would see the fruit of your Holy Spirit in the lives of our friends who need you so desperately. Father, we lift up the rest of this service and ask that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Let the people of God say, Amen. <laughs>
Again, Father, we thank you and praise you for all the good gifts that you have distributed to us. You've called us to be stewards of the riches that you have provided, and we ask, Lord, that we would be found faithful for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our confession of faith this morning is taken from the Westminster Confession, chapter 13, Sanctification, article number 3. Let's read it together. Although the old nature temporarily wins battles in this warfare, the continued strengthening of the sanctifying spirit of Christ enables the regenerate nature in each believer to overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah actually the 61st chapter, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Pastor Dave mentioned earlier uh, the 6th chapter of Isaiah and the very beginning of the 6th chapter, the first verse, in the year that King Isaiah died. And so we, we date the prophecies of Isaiah from about 747 B.C. to 701 B.C., a period of some 40 years of time. And then beginning with the first verse. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, and oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. This is the word of the Lord. We continue this morning our study of the beautiful attitudes, the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. The second Beatitude is, blessed are those who mourn, happy are those who are sad. Does that not sound like a contradiction in terms? Well, I hope this morning that I can show you that this is actually a powerful paradox. That it's only when we truly grieve a loss that we can experience God's comfort and healing. One other clarification about this second beatitude, a lot of commentators spiritualize it and say that it describes sorrow for sin. I don't agree. I think the first beatitude describes that. But the word that Jesus uses here, the Greek word is patheo, which means passionate grief for the dead or other suffering. That word has come into English. We use the term pathos to describe emotional grief and pathetic, something that is truly sad. Well, listen to the word of God as we find it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I'll repeat it. It's only when we truly grieve a loss that we can experience God's comfort and His acceptance. I believe that mourning is a God-given response to a significant loss. In fact, the degree of grief and mourning that we feel is an indication of how much we value something that we've lost. The greatest loss in my life was 
my mom, who died when I was 18 years old. A little bit over a year ago, on March 2nd, 2019, I experienced a new kind of mourning. That would have been actually her 100th birthday. And I used that day to remember. I felt a lot of sadness at the loss of my mom, but I also remembered with joy all of the good things that she brought into my life. I think I've come to a point of acceptance of that loss. But I remember another loss in which my grief was way out of proportion. When Ann and I were young marrieds, we bought our first new car. It was a bright blue Plymouth Duster. It got about seven miles to the gallon, but we thought it was really cool. And then some not very nice person put a huge scratch on the passenger side of our brand new car. I was furious. I took rubbing compound. I got my little touch-up paint, tried to fix it, but nothing worked. And I wanted to find that person and really smack him. And then I realized, this is a car. My grief was way out of proportion to the sense of loss. And I think that sometimes happens. God calls us to grieve those losses that really matter. Scripture never suggests that Christians shouldn't grieve. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. Our grief is different than the world because we have hope. Nevertheless, we are still called to grieve. Look at Jesus' example. We see Jesus in the seventh chapter of Luke going into the little town of Nain, and he encounters a widow. And this widow has lost her only son. And when Jesus sees her, he has compassion. That Greek word means he literally feels with her. And he is deeply moved and deeply troubled. Jesus heals, brings back to life that son. He goes to the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. And even though Jesus knows that he is going to bring Lazarus back to life, he is touched and deeply moved by the loss of Mary and Martha and Lazarus' friends. And in that well-known verse in John 11, it says, Jesus wept. Jesus knew how to grieve. And in fact, he expressed grief freely. When we were in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania years ago, a young mother in our congregation lost her young son in a really tragic accident. The church was packed for the funeral, and she walked into the funeral smiling, telling people that she was rejoicing that her son was in heaven. And six months later, she had a massive nervous breakdown. Death is not our friend. I don't believe that death was God's original plan for mankind. It was only after the sin of Adam and Eve that death came into the world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Even though we know and we believe in eternal life, death is not a pleasant thing. It's appropriate for us to grieve and to mourn. One of the books that really changed my life, and I hope will have an impact on you this morning, was written by a German Christian named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a psychiatrist. It was a groundbreaking book called On Death and Dying. 
And Kubler-Ross was the first one to identify five stages of grief. I believe these stages are God-given, and I believe Jesus exhibits those five stages in the Garden of Gethsemane. Stage number one, denial. You know that Jesus told his disciples a number of times before they went to Jerusalem that he was to go to Jerusalem and to die at the hands of the Gentiles. And yet, on the day before that death, Jesus is in the garden praying, and he says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Let this suffering pass from me. I don't want to be crucified on the cross. Jesus was fully human. And he recognized the agony that awaited him. And so he says, Lord, if there's another way, I'm all for it. Denial is a defense mechanism that God has given us to be able to deal with loss. If you ever watch TV and the cops come to the front door of the person whose loved one has been killed, they always respond, no, that can't be. I just talked to them yesterday. Denial. It's only a bad thing if it's prolonged. Another great book about loss is Joyce Lindorf's book, Morning Song. She talks about her dad. Her mother had stage four cancer, was at hospice and dying. And her dad goes out and buys a brand new refrigerator because that's what his wife always wanted. That's denial. The second stage is anger. I felt anger when that person keyed my brand new car. Anger is a natural and even necessary response to loss. I believe Jesus was angry in the garden when he goes to his dear friends, his disciples. He has Peter, James, and John just outside where he's praying. And he asks them, would you pray with me? I am really hurting. Three times Jesus goes to them, and are they praying for their dear Savior? No, they're sleeping. Could you not wait with me for one hour, Jesus says? Just before going to Gethsemane, Jesus confronts the people who are after him, who want to take his life, the Pharisees. And he says, you know what? You guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of death. It's you who murdered the prophets, and you're about to murder me. How will you escape being sent to hell? Friends, that's anger. When a drunk driver nearly killed my entire family in 1977, my wife was in a coma for three weeks, I had dreams of encountering this guy and putting my hands around his throat. I was angry. I would pray with my sons before going to the hospital to visit my wife, and one of those mornings, my son Jonathan said, Lord, please forgive the man who hit us. And I began to weep uncontrollably. It's like the anger that I was feeling just poured out of my body. God spoke to me through a little child, and I was able to forgive. Anger is a God-given response to loss. We have to learn to deal with it and to move on. The third stage is bargaining. That's what Jesus was doing in the garden. God, if there's any other way, please let this cup of suffering pass from me. 
I've been with a lot of people who are dying. And I've heard a lot of bargaining. I remember one man saying, Lord, please, let me live long enough to see my grandson get married. In fact, I've heard prayers like that a number of times, and usually God answers them positively. Again, bargaining is just fine as long as we say, as Jesus did, not my will, but yours be done. And then there's depression. When Jesus says in the garden, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. That is depression. It can be the most difficult thing about dealing with a loss. And that loss isn't just death. People who are confined to a wheelchair Deal with the grief of that loss. When we lose an ability, we deal with that grief. It's God's way of saying, slow down. You need some time to recover from this loss. That's why it's good advice to people when they lose a loved one. Don't make any major decisions in the first year or so. Perhaps the worst advice we can give to somebody who's dealing with depression and loss is snap out of it. You've got to keep on living. Now, C.S. Lewis describes what he calls the laziness of grief, that it can last for a long time. There's no timetable on depression. But if we go through those four stages, The fifth stage is the prize, and that is acceptance. Jesus says, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. My betrayer is at hand. He came to the point of acceptance. I remember the first person I visited in the hospital who was dying. Her name was Arlene Strzok. She had end-stage renal failure, and her skin was bright yellow. I would go in to visit her and say, do you think I look like Big Bird, Pastor Dave? She had a great sense of humor. She always shared her candy with me, which was a wonderful thing. She had Russell Stover's, the Cadillac of chocolate. But she said to me, about a week before she died. Pastor, I'm not in denial. I know that my time is coming to an end, but I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. She quoted 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Her memorial service was a celebration because God had used her life in a powerful way. She had come to acceptance. When we come to that point, we make a transition from what is lost to what is left. And the second part of the Beatitudes speaks to that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word that's translated comforted is the Greek word parakletos, which literally means to call alongside, to call alongside. It's the word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit. He is the one who comes alongside of us to provide comfort. It's the word that was used in the courtroom of a defense attorney who defended us against the accusations of diabolos, the accuser, Satan. The Holy Spirit comes to us to comfort us in our grief and in our loss. Jesus says, it's good for you that I go because if I don't go, 
If I did not go, the Comforter would not come to you. And he will be in you and with you. His Holy Spirit's comfort is available to us all the time. In the passage that Wallace read this morning, the prophet Isaiah gives a prophecy of the Messiah. The Greek word that's translated anointed, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me, is literally the word for Messiah. And it's the passage that Jesus uses in his very first sermon back home in Nazareth. The Spirit of God is upon me because he's anointed me to give comfort to those who mourn. The comfort of Jesus Christ is available to us when we truly mourn our losses. If we stay in denial, we miss that comfort. But if we allow God's Holy Spirit to work through those five stages, and we come to the place of acceptance, God's Holy Spirit anoints us and ministers to us in a powerful way. There are two things the Spirit uses. One is time. Our call to worship says, Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's poetic for the fact that you can mourn for a while, but then God will bring his joy. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. Time is part of what the Spirit uses, and support is another. Romans 12, 15 tells us as the church to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Jesus gives us that example, doesn't he? And it's as we, the people of God, surround one another with that loving mourning that God provides support. We have the opportunity to do that August 29th for the family of Roger Christofferson. Give God your grief, friends, and let his spirit lead you to growth and to acceptance. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Would you pray with me? Father God, each one of us in this room has experienced loss. Loss of people that we loved a great deal. Loss of abilities. Loss of vocations that gave us a sense of identity. Lord, help us to mourn those losses appropriately and to experience your comfort and acceptance. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together our closing hymn, Abide With Me. Let us stand.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.